some philosophers or some people who study Buddhism um, define vipassana, contemplation as something else. They call it mindfulness. Most people call meditation mindfulness. Translating contemplation and concentration into mindfulness is not exactly right. Because the word mindful, that means you're only paying attention to. Your mind is filled with attention. Your mind is mindful, full, full mind, a mind that is full, mindful. So a mind that is full of impressions, full of attention, full of thinking and all that. Actually, it's very difficult sometimes to translate a Sanskrit word. Uh, mindfulness is not the best translation, but that's the most commonly recognized. It should, it should really be uh, mental introspection. So in other words, when you are doing meditation, you're not trying to fill your mind with mindful, full, filling, filling your mind with thoughts. You're trying to empty your mind. How can you, how can you fill your mind with thoughts? You, you empty your mind because our, our minds have, have been, have been um, confused with, uh, with uh, mental afflictions, defilements, like greediness, jealousy, hatred, anxiety, all kinds of mental defilements. So, so what is the most important is to empty them, not to fill them with all these. So I still think that introspection is, is, is a better approach because you are internally trying to empty your mind using, using introspection, internal reflection. So maybe from, from now on we should use introspection, mental introspection and not mindfulness. I already explained Concentration, uh, samatha, and I like to briefly, only have half an hour left, I only briefly explain what is satipatthana. Because in, in contemplation we said we use satipatthana. In very simple English, what is satipatthana? Satipatthana is the cultivation of mental introspection leading to detachment and liberation of mental afflictions. So this kind of introspection leads you to detach, leads you to empty. It doesn't need you to add on, add on more impressions, add on more um, egoistic impressions, how to be successful, how to get wealth, how to be famous, how to make a lot of money, how to invest in real estate, how to be better than all the others. <laughs> The, uh, not that, leading to detachment. We want to detach and liberation of mental afflictions. Uh, these mental afflictions, of course, contain uh, karmic fermentation. When we say karmic, we have every, everybody has that karmic energy in, inside of them. And this energy is, is, you know, it's going through process of fermentation adding in more, making it more, making it roll into actions and speech and actual thoughts, etc., etc. So when you're doing Satipatthana contemplation, I'm giving an example. A thought arises, for example, an anxiety of fear, a depression, or greediness, or jealousy. I don't know what kind of thought arises in you all the time. Thought of compassion, thought of helpfulness, thought of always trying to, to empty your, your, your mind of defilements. What kind of thought you have? You know what kind of thought arises in you all the time. You may not even realize what kind of thought arises in you until you have brought your thought into action. Some people don't even realize a thought is fermented in the mind. A thought of selfishness, a thought of, um, I don't know, so many thoughts. So for example, I'm giving an example, a thought arises. Uh, the example is depression or, or anxiety or fear or worry. Uh, and then what next? 
You are being aware of the arising of such thought. Oh, I am feeling depressed now. I have anxiety. And how come I get jealous of John, uh, who make a lot of money? Um, how come I get jealous of Jeanette, who is prettier than me? And how come I'm jealous of uh, Mr. Johnson, who has a good family and I have a broken family? All kinds of you are. You become aware when you are doing meditation. You are become aware of this thought arises. How come this lady talked to me like that an hour ago? He, um, she, she's not being courteous. She is attacking into my um, self confidence. Oh, why? Why did she yell at me? All kinds of thoughts. Why did my Brother would talk to me like that. Um, so, but when a thought, when such a thought arises, you, you know, okay, I am aware of such a thought. A thought of fear in me. I, I become fearful. I have anxiety. You are aware of it, right? You become aware of it. Some people are not even aware. When they become anxious, they just get anxious. When they become they have fear. They just feel fear. They don't realize that you have to detach yourself away from it and look at it. A serpent comes up. You look at the serpent. The serpent comes up. The serpent of anxiety. The snake of anxiety. The snake of fear comes up. He's going to bite you. So you're going to get a stick and say, "Hold down his head." You watched it. It's not easy to know, to watch, to stand away as a third person, looking at your thought. You're always the singular I. I am fearful. I have anxiety. I have jealousy. But you should stand away from it and say, "He has that." Such a thought comes up now. I got to watch it. A thought comes up. A thought of greediness comes up. A thought of jealousy. Jealousy comes up, so you become become aware of it. You introspect, you you do an introspection of such a thought, and then you say, "Watch the thought with the four contemplations." What are the four contemplations? The body. You remember the four contemplation? The body, the feeling, the mind. And the mental impressions. Let's take an example of the body. When such a thought of anxiety comes up in me, how does the body react? I guess my hormone is coming. I feel fear. I'm sweating. I don't feel comfortable. I have muscle pain. I have a headache. What kind of bodily impressions you have at that time? Oh, I have a headache because of this anxiety. Oh, I want to hurt myself. I don't want to exist in this world. I'm more down. You feel that your body react to it. You should feel that, and you should say that body is not me. It's just a thought. How can I identify myself with such a thought? It's just a thought. But I'm mixed up with a thought. I attach to the thought. I, th I thought I am that thought, but that thought is not me. It's only a thought, right? It's only a thought coming up. But you want to identify yourself with that thought, and you want to feel in such a way that thought wants you to feel. You're a slave of that thought. But that thought is you. You think it's difficult. It's difficult to distance yourself. From that thought that is generated in your mind, it takes training. You think just by me telling you to, de to detach yourself from that thought, you can do it successfully? Absolutely not. You have to go through s a t i p a t a n a thing, training. The meditators train and train and train. Nothing comes easy. You think happiness comes easy? Nothing comes easy. You have to work at it. Instead of watching your YouTube, your entertaining programs, 
a lot of people are putting time to train themselves in this. And you are putting time to train yourself in what? Watching entertaining programs, you know, trying to be pleasure, senses, fulfillment of pleasure. You're not working at it. You're not a studious student working at it, whereas the other guys are working really hard at it. They should get an A. And if you're not working at it, you should fail. Right? You're the master of yourself. How come you don't master it and become a slave to it? You should make that decision. From today on, you know, you've got to be a master of yourself. You have to do introspection. You have to go through that that training. You have to train yourself to do it. Some people say meditation is just a yoga exercise. You get good health. More than that. Meditation is to go for enlightenment, not just for health. Some people even go to the thinking, I do meditation so that I, I look beautiful, so that I, have, I, can, I, I can be in good health, and some people, some people even go to the, the gambit of meditation can, can make my sex life better. Some people think that way. They're going, they're going to the wrong direction. They're enhancing their greediness, their jealousy, their seek for sensual pleasures in them. They've gone the wrong way. They're not looking for enlightenment. For the awakening. Okay, watch the thought with the four contemplations and then how, the, how does my body react to it? And how do I feel? I feel anxious. I feel feared. I shouldn't have that feeling. I'm not that thought. How did my mind think? My mind persistently want to be involved with that thought. Everything is about yourself. Nobody can help you. You think the Buddha can help you just by saying, Buddha, 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 the name of Buddha, Buddha can help you? No, you are your own Buddha. You have to do it yourself. If Buddha can help you to get out from anxiety, there will be no one suffering from anxiety because the Buddha is supposed to be all compassionate. Any request will be fulfilled. But the Buddha said, I can only tell you how to do it but I cannot do it for you because you are that body, you are that thought in you. It's just like the professor can never write examination for you. You have to write examination. You have to study, you have to train yourself to get an A, to get an A. Is it logical? And then finally, if, if, if your training is good, you let go of it. You let go of the depression. You let go of that, for example, that thought of laziness. Actually, you should have come up from your sleep to work at something. You should study, you should do something, but you're too lazy. You just want to lazily lie in your bed. Nobody can convince you. Remember when you're a child, when your dad wants to wake you up, your mom wants to wake you up to go to school, you always want to linger on for another minute. Because you, you're just being overwhelmed by the thought of laziness. You're going to push yourself to come up. Now this is a very simple example. In doing meditation, that's why you have to let go. Not just training your concentration. But you have to have concentration first before you can let go. Because if your, your mind is all confused, profused with desultory thoughts, how can you let go? So first of all, you have to get control of your own mind. Then, once you know your own mind, you can gradually, gradually let go. And you have to go through training. How long is the training? It, it differs from individual to individual. Some people take one or two months, one or two years, and some people take eight years, nine years, ten years. Lifetime, reincarnations, life cycle. It takes a long time. 
For some people, it takes a short time. Depends on how, how hard you work at it. Meditation. Meditation, we start from the lower bottom. We want to meditate, and we know that meditation contains two major aspects, the concentration and the contemplation. And then we also know that if our concentration is good, we get to samadhi, which is the mental equanimity and, con and control. If your concentration works well, after training yourself, the samatha, then concentration is just a method. Concentration is a method of doing it. And, and when, if the method is right, if you have done it right, if you are diligently always carrying it out, then you get into what? Samadhi, mental equanimity. That's the result. There's cost. The cost is concentration. The result is samadhi. It's mental equanimity and control. So there's cost and effect. We call it causality. Everything is cost and effect. Whatever you sow, you reap. You only reap what you sow. You, you, you never can reap something that you haven't sown. Right? You have to do it yourself. So concentration leads to mental equanimity and control. And contemplation would lead to, we call it prajna, which is temporal and spiritual wisdom. Not just temporal. Temporal is worldly wisdom. And spiritual is metaphysical, beyond the world. It, 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 it's beyond, beyond logic, beyond the world. And then when you get on the samadhi, you get on the Buddhahood, or we call it enlightenment, and some people call it awakening, liberation from samsara, from life and death, no more life and death, which is the Buddhahood, enlightenment, or awakening. At this stage, maybe we should especially for beginners, we should say something very direct, very concrete, very down to earth. In order to understand what is awakening, what is enlightening, we have to know a little bit of history. What led 2,600 years ago a prince in northern India in, in, in the kingdom of Kapilavastu. What led the prince, Siddhartha Gautama, what led him to seek enlightenment in the first place before he became the Buddha? What led him? This, it's a very simple question. What led Siddhartha Gautama to his awakening? Why did he, why did he uh, try to get awakening? Why did he get enlightenment? According to his own account, his search for enlightenment began many lifetimes ago. Not just that lifetime when he was a prince. His, he was in search of enlightenment many, many samsara, many, many lifetimes ago. But in that lifetime, it was sparkled by the realization of the inevitability Inevitable, inevitability of aging, sickness, death, mental defilements, greediness, hatred, sorrow, all this. It was, all of a sudden, it was sparkled by what he saw, what he experienced. And I like to quote what he said in, in, in Sutra. He said, I live in the utmost luxuries, he said. I had three palaces. One for the cold season, one for the hot season, and one for the rainy season. Imagine the prince. He was a prince. You know, in the future, he would succeed his father to be the king. And he lived in three palaces. And during the one for rainy season, rainy, rainy season palace, and during the four months of rainy season in, in India, there, was four, there were four months of rainy season, I was entertained in the rainy season palace by minstrels, minstrel musicians, entertainers, 
and ladies in court, courtesans, and all the kind of ladies in the in the palace, royal ladies. And he had the most. He said, "He said I had the most luxuries in food and lodging, whereas the servants and workers of ordinary families were fed with just lentil soup and 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 cooked rice." My servants and my workers were fed with the wheat, rice, and the best meat. You see how how luxuries the prince enjoyed in, in the three palaces with a lot of people. But he wasn't happy. He was endowed with such fortune, but he wasn't happy. Why wasn't he happy? He said, "Before my self awakening." When I was still just an unawakened Buddhisattva, up the Buddha to be, being subject myself to birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow, and defilements, I sought happiness in what was subject to birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow, and defilements. You know what that means? I was looking for for awakening that it, that was detached from aging, sickness, death. Sorrow, changeability, but now I was look. I was enjoying luxuries, which were all subject to aging, all subject to death, all subject to changeability, all subject to flexibility. I should be. I should be in search of something that is beyond all these. Why am I being subject myself to death, birth, defilement, seeking what is subject to death, defilements? What if I were to seek the unborn, unaging, unerring, undying, sorrowless, undefiled, unexcelled security from bondage of life? He was seeking from something more advanced. But imagine what we're doing in here, essentially being you and I. What were we seeking? Sensual pleasures. You watch television. You enjoy food. You enjoy luxuries, clothes, fame, reputation, wealth. That's what ordinary people were looking for. They were not satisfied with their present status. They're living. We're living in an apartment, a bachelor apartment with only one room. We're looking for a two-room apartment, and then we have a, a big apartment. We're looking for a house in Sonnesy. And when we have a sonnet house, we're looking for something bigger and bigger and better and better. We're we're only looking for joy, for for luxuries. Well, these luxuries were subject to decay, aging, flexibility, changeability, and finally the death. Why are we doing that? Have we ever paused and think about why we are doing that? And also in the process of looking for all those things. We perform a lot of bad karma. In order to make money, some people what they were involved in businesses and trades or illegal illegal trades, or in 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 a livelihood that were hurtful to in, to individuals, like killing, hunting, slaughtering, you know, uh, fur coat killing a lot of fur, for, with seal, you know, um, intoxications. Um, you know, many many um, businesses that incur, incur a lot of bad karma. So the Buddha, the Buddha to be, Prince Tathagata, at a later time when he was still young, and dealt with the blessings of youth in the first stage of life, he shaved out his head and, and beard. Though my, he, he said, though my parents wished otherwise and were grieving with tears on their faces. When Prince Siddhartha wanted to be a monk, the king and the queen were grieved with tears, and didn't want him to leave. But finally, he left the palace and went into a home life. Went from home life into into what homelessness, as an ascetic, in search of the philosophy of going beyond all these. And after eight years of hardship. Eight years of difficult times in the practice. Mind you, he already practiced in previous lives. He practiced for many, many, many lifetimes. It was just in this lifetime he was it was sparkle, 
by what he experienced, that he wanted, in, wanted to be an ascetic and, and in search of the awakening that he was hoping for. So, what did we learn from this? What did we learn from history? What did we learn from that Buddha? He gave up his luxuries for something much better, for something away from life and death. What are we doing? We're seeking luxuries and we're not satisfied. We're not satisfied. We always want to increase the level of luxuries. Are we not fooling ourselves? This is what enlightenment is all about. Why did we do all these things? In order just to be healthy? In order just to be happy in this life? This life will soon end, you know. This life, life is short. This life will soon come to an end. You think you are 25 years old and you still have 80 years ahead of you, given that you live up to 125? No. Death is awaiting for everybody. Old and young. Don't waste your time. Just as what Prince Siddhartha did. Spend your time in spiritual pursuit. Something much higher. Don't just be satisfied with what you got now in terms of spirituality. Not in terms of materiality. Materiality would not make us happy. It, won't, it would only increase our greediness, sorrow, lamentation. This is what the Buddha told us. He gave us an example. 